Shabbat was a blessing, three. though. Mm -hmm. Oh, give thanks unto <laughs> the Lord. That was nice, man. That was nice. Yeah, it was Shout cool. out to the Jeffers. Yeah. Woo! I'm not going to lie to you. I, the extrovert in me struggled today being at home by myself. Mm -hmm. The extrovert in you, is there anything else? <laughs> 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 oh, potentially, you never know. There's a little bit of introvert. I don't know. But I'm going to struggle being at home by myself today. I just thought, Sam, mm. keep yourself to yourself. Mm -mm. <laughs> it's yeah. true. I mean, I'm, I'm, not really a, I'm not really a singer, but I, I must admit today, man, I was, uh, I was just singing in, in, in the room while, while the, with, with the Jeffers going. Yeah, uh, same here. Me too, me too. Same here. I'm by Yummy. myself in the house. Giving it some, giving it some, um, some <laughs> <laughs> Woo! It's a Robinson's. Hey, Happy birthday to me. What's going on? Okay. I know it's, I know it's late, yes. but. Yeah, all the things. Mm -hmm. A whole piano, look at God. Wow. <laughs> it's been so long. <laughs> I feel like I haven't spoken to you in about 10 years. What's going Hello, on? Hello, Sam. You are right there? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? How does this feel? How to? How does this feel? <laughs> oh, it's calm, but I'm in London at the moment. Oh, then one's there. Okay. Yeah, I work in London. I'm trying okay, not to go sorry. back. But... <laughs> Let's not do this on the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll talk to you later, Tanya. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's cool. <laughs> Welcome, guys. Thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you, well, for everyone. We pray you had a good Sabbath day mm. and uh, the Lord bless you and wherever you worship in whatever form and whichever stream you listened into that you gained a blessing from, from that. We're going to start this evening. We um, have some special guests. We'll introduce them in just a minute. But right now, the panel, introduce yourselves. Hello, I'm Nisa from Doncaster. Hi, I'm Melissa from Townworth slash Birmingham. Sam from Wolverhampton. Nice, I'm from Birmingham. Uh, we hope to have Pastor Pad and Chenjirai join us as well sometime this evening, we hope. Um, and then we have a musical rendition that we brought to us in just a moment. We'll introduce them later on. So like, we'll, we'll start ahead um, with Melissa. She's going to be leading us in our uh, presentation this evening. And so I'll hand over to her. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, so our theme for this evening's week of prayer is a new life and the question is can anyone really change no conversion oh. story in the bible is quite as dramatic as that of Saul to Paul Saul was a highly educated guy he got a first in the school of the Pharisees and went all out for the wrong cause to destroy this new sect of Christ followers as a prominent figure in the Pharisaic circles, we don't know if Saul could have attended that midnight trial of Jesus, or maybe Saul may have gathered with the other scribes and Pharisees at the Jordan River when John the Baptist declared, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We meet Saul, a zealous persecutor of the Jews, standing in silent approval, keeping an eye on the coats of his colleagues who were casually stoning Stephen only to have his life turned around later when Jesus himself appears to him asking why are you persecuting me I am Jesus the one you are persecuting imagine the shock the regret the remorse of a man who had given his whole life to searching villages homes and where anyone who believed in Christ that prophet who had, had disturbed the peace and reportedly had risen from the dead was thrown into prison but Jesus had an incredible plan to take this great sinner and transform his life into a testimony, a forgiven new life in him. What I've come to appreciate about this story is the power of the Holy Spirit to not only bring forgiveness and transformation, but also bring an ending that ends in humble self-distrust. You see, Jesus sends Ananias to meet Saul, Ananias risking his life to minister to this accomplice to murder. And his words to Saul ring true for us today. He said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will, to see the just one and to hear the words of his mouth for all the people, you shall be his witness and tell what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Arise, be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord in Acts 22 verses 12 to 16. Imagine that God had chosen this persecutor of his people to become an apostle and an evangelist. 
The experience of Saul on the Damascus road takes him from being this overconfident, prideful Pharisee to a self-distrusting, humble Christ follower who declares himself in 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 to be the chief of sinners. An unrecognizable, astonishing transformation. You see, our great God is still in the business of saving great sinners. From Hindu nationalists who have persecuted Christians in India to Islamic extremists who have murdered pastors in northern Nigeria, their stories of conversion stand as testament to the power of our mighty God who's able to save to the uttermost. That save forgets forgiveness is just as readily available to the people in our lives who hurt us the most, but it's also available to you and to me. Amen. 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 Thank you, Melissa. Appreciate that. Um, so we're going to go a little bit more into this story um, this evening, as well as recapping some of the key points this week. Um, before we do so, we're greatly blessed to have this evening some special guests from Huddersfield. If you could introduce yourself. Okay, so I'm Javine, and this is my brother, Joel. And they've kindly agreed to join us um, this evening to share with us a, a um meditational a item of music so i'm going to hand over to them and let them take it away amen much appreciate your willingness to share with us and those who are watching on the wider online audience appreciate that all right guys as we dig into our study for today on the theme of new life and looking at the conversion story of Saul to Paul. My first question to you, based on Acts chapter 9, why do you think Jesus himself appeared to Saul? Mm, I think some people are so bad. (laughs) 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 they, they They need the chief to come and talk to them. That's the first thought that comes to mind, but there's probably something more, more, more deeper or profound than that. I think my first thought there is that it was evidence of his resurrection mm-hmm. because Saul was just, I suppose, I don't want to say in denial, but he just wouldn't accept Christ. And the fact that Jesus had died and now he had risen again and spoken to him directly was almost evidence for him, undeniable evidence that I am alive. Mm-hmm. It's a good I question. Think- Sorry, go on, my son. Oh, it was me. I think, I think the, uh, the issue of the resurrection was a key issue for the first century church. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it becomes the main, in many ways, the main subject Paul preaches about. And I think it was one of the hardest things for Jews to accept was the resurrection. So I think that's a, that's a key point that you brought up, that that's why Jesus would have come, because he had to show evidence of that. Show up. Mm-hmm. You know that passage where Jesus, this is just me thinking out loud, where... Jesus turns to some people and says, you know, though Moses or someone else was to come back from the dead, um, you, you wouldn't believe anyway. Um, mm. We're here, um, you know, if you haven't believed what's written down in the Bible, but here, Paul gets this extra biblical evidence that um, not everybody else has been privy to get. That's true. Mm. Um, why Paul? I think one of the things that came to my mind is always like um, I was just remembering the book of Galatians when Paul was writing and one of when his ministry comes under attack, one of his central defense points was the fact that he didn't receive his gospel from other people, but he got it directly from Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. So I think it also gave greater credence to his ministry, Mm -hmm. which was always Mm -hmm. being um, always he was always criticized because of his past. But then the fact that he had seen Jesus himself, he knew that he wasn't living any kind of um hallucinations he knew mm. that what he was saying was real which pushed him through the persecution that he went through as well mm. Mm. i think that's a powerful point he got it straight from jesus yeah yeah because mm. i think that was when that was one of the when they were choosing the next apostle there were certain things I, mean, I can't remember exactly what it is but there were certain things that they needed to to have done and bum, 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 bum. let me look Carry on whilst I'm looking. <laughs> well, I think the other thing as well was maybe going to the topic that we're discussing as well. Given the magnitude of his sins in terms of how he was actually physically persecuting Christians, 
Mm. I think it meant a lot for Paul to hear from Jesus himself that he had been forgiven. I think this is one of the things where he could recognize that he was the chief of sinners, but he knew that Jesus had died for him and loved him specifically, that he actually came and received the gospel directly from Jesus himself. He could then move on a little bit probably more fluently mm. than if he had just had the gospel from Paul, for example, or from Peter, for example, or somebody else. Okay. Mm. Ignore what I was going to say earlier on. Don't worry about it. Okay. Mm. I just, so someone just messaged and it's true. I, we forgot to pray when we started. Oh. As we continue in the word, let's pray. Father in heaven, as we continue to discuss your word, as we continue to open and read your word and discuss these important themes this evening, we pray for your Holy Spirit to Continue to bless and guide our minds and to be with those of us, those who are listening online. We ask and pray for your Holy Spirit to direct our thoughts and our minds in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Thanks. Mm. Sorry, I don't know who, whose flow I cut up there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm back in verse four of chapter nine, Acts chapter nine and verse four, um, where... Paul has, Saul has fallen to the ground and a voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I'm fascinated by that because he, he thought he was persecuting people. Like he wasn't out saying, you know, I'm out persecuting Jesus. He was out persecuting the people and Jesus made that distinction that actually you're doing this to me. And it made me think about forgiveness. And when we are holding things against people or trying to get revenge, it isn't against those people, but we're actually hurting God in mm. that too. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's right. How do you think he would have felt? Like I kind of described it a little kind of with words like remorse and regret, but kind of in that moment to be, to face, to come face to face, I guess, with the truth of a life that you've been living um, and been so committed in the opposite direction. How do you think it would have felt for him? If I was Paul, probably, uh, I, I, we know this is true from the spirit of prophecy from the you know, Acts of the Apostles, but I think just generally speaking, if I was Paul, one of the things that probably would have been very hard to forget is the stoning of Stephen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the powerful someone that he preaches, how they see his face shining like an angel. But one of the things that he says just before he dies was that he looked up and he says that he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And I think that's probably one of the things when he hears Jesus would, would have come just flashing back into his mind. Like mm -hmm. he was the one who was consenting. He was one of the mm -hmm. people who was consenting to the death of Stephen. And I think that's a, that's a heavy thing to know that you're responsible for the death of an innocent man. It's kind of like that conviction, but maybe also that remorse and that guilt that made him end up fasting for like three days straight. Mm. Mm. I think Alice, we don't, don't we don't have too much into that experience of Paul and and Stephen, but the Bible does say obviously when Stephen was being stoned, they laid their coats at, at the feet of a man named Saul, um, who was there uh, watching. Um, when you go to stories of the Reformation, which is a little bit more modern, and we have uh, written history in more detail of that time. And we know that there was many reformers, not just reformers, but many Christians during that time who, who were killed or who were killed publicly. And it, it was recorded in several countries that they had to start killing the Christians at night because they found that when they killed them in the daytime, there was, <laughs> it was counterproductive. They were getting more conversions at their death than they were hmm. in their life. And so I think when you go back to that story of Stephen, that impact that Stephen would have had on, on Saul unknowingly to him, where he, he died with grace and he died with, you know, the Holy spirit. And that like, so I think nice and just said that, that, that image of, of seeing Stephen Stone would have been, would have been left with him, not only what he did to the Christians, but how he was when he died. And mm. yeah. Another thing that I found out today is that Saul actually had family members who would become Christians before he became a Christian. You see that in Romans 16, verse seven, salute, and it names two people, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Mm. So Saul's got these different influences that are coming at him from different angles. Um, 
you know, he's, he's seen Stephen go off into vision and his face is like the, the face of an angel. He's got family who have converted. Um, mm. You've got Gamaliel, who's the person who he, 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 he learned at his feet. A bit later on, when they're wondering what to do with, um, you know, are we going to put them in prison? Are we going to kill them? And Gamaliel just seems to be more, um, have an approach of, let's wait and see what happens. So he's kind of more a softer in his approach than say Saul seems to be right now. So he's got these different influences in his life. And I feel like this probably chapter nine of Acts is a kind of culmination of different thoughts that may have been going on in his head. And then Jesus just confronts him. And I think everybody has that moment in time or in their life where you kind of, you've been thinking about something, different influences, God's been speaking you through different influences. And then boom, you're in church and the, 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 per, the preacher just says exactly what you've been thinking. Mm. Um, or someone calls you and says, and just says exactly what you've been thinking up until that point. I think everyone's been there at some stage. Mm. I just think that was Saul's moment. Mm. And maybe as well, one thing that I was thinking of was remembering the fact that when Saul was persecuting the church, he wasn't doing it because he was a malicious person or he was vindictive or, or anything like that. He was doing it because he thought he was actually doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in Philippians chapter three, verse, what is it? Verse six, he talked about how it, w- it was because of his zeal that he was persecuting the Christians because he believed so much in the Jewish uh, message. And I was just imagining it's like one of those moments where you've believed something is true all your life. Mm-hmm. And then in that moment, you realize that everything that you thought was right was actually wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to also mm-hmm. deal with this process. How do you process that? He's a Pharisee. He's been fasting. He's been studying this since he was a kid. And now all of a sudden he realizes that everything that he thought was true, at least most of it was a lie. He's having to deal with that as well on a personal level. Mm-hmm. Do you think because he had to think of all of that and to deal with that processing that there was some self-forgiveness that he had to go through? I think he would have had to because he had done a lot, you know. Yeah. He had done a lot to the church. Mm-hmm. And so in that moment when uh, verse 6 it says, Lord, what will you have me do? Mm-hmm. You know, he's, he's like, you know, what, what do you want me to do? Like, so he's, there's all these feelings of self-realization and, and, and who he is, is is flashing right before him in that moment on his road to Damascus experience. And that's when the Lord says, he doesn't really address the issue that maybe Paul was thinking he was going to address right then. Like, maybe when he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He's thinking, I'll go make restitution or go do this or go do that. And the Lord's like, oh, um, go into the city and, I, and it will be told you what you'll do. So even in how the Lord kind of deals with him from that point, he just kind of does him step by step or go to the city and then you'll find a person here and then you'll find something there. Like he doesn't just dump load on, on, on Saul, everything that he's expecting of him or what the plan for his life is. The first thing he says is, oh, go to the city. Mm. 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 Before, you, before we move on with that, I mean, if you come back a bit, verse five, when it says, it's hard for you to kick against the bricks. So I looked up that, pricks thing and apparently it's like a sharp instrument that they used to try and speed oxen up as they were plowing the field and it's saying that um paul had been resisting the pricks of the spirit mm-hmm. and um jesus is saying to him you know it's hard for you to resist what i've been trying what i've been so, so basically it's almost like this isn't the first time i've spoken to you but now this is the first time i'm speaking to you like this and for a while you've been resisting what i've been trying to tell you Mm. and um i just think many of us sometimes find ourselves in that situation absolutely Mm -hmm. and i think as well don't forget that when he gets up he's blinded by the light Mm. Mm. so that there's a physical element to this whole thing as well he can't see i mean that must be so scary Mm. he he doesn't know if he's going to ever see again at this point in time he just knows that he's blind in that moment Mm. But, th- but then it moves on, doesn't it? So Paul, Saul, Paul, he's there and he's blind. Um, and then God asks Ananias to go to him. Now, people know all about what Paul has been up to and what Paul is about. Like people who are in the church, they know that, the people who make up the church. And then someone is actually sent to Paul. If I was Ananias and 
God has said to me, you know, go and speak to Paul, I would be, I would be afraid. And I think I would be harboring unforgiveness in my own heart about approaching him just out of fear. Yeah, I think they'll back up a little bit. And, and I always like verse 11 and 12 before we get to 13, um, just to kind of give some background, like Ananias. God says to him, the Lord says to him, An Ananias, and he says, I am here. You know, so like if the Lord came to us tonight as we're lying in our bed, we'd be like, here, I'm here. And he tells him what to do. He's like, arise. He's like, okay, go to the street called straight. And I can imagine Ananias in his mind going, yeah, 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 no worries. I know exactly where that is. And he's like, and go to the house of Judas. And he's like, yeah, I know who Judas is. You know, we're, we're friends. Or, I, you know, my friend knows him. And then he goes, inquire for one named Saul, for he prays and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming. So he leads him on. He's like, you know, arise. Yep. Go to the city. Yep. Go to the street. Yep. Go to this house. Okay. And ask for Saul. And it's at that point that verse 13 is when Ananias says, Lord, and this is what always gets me. He says, Lord, I have heard by many. What's another word for that? Word on the street. I've been told. He's like, I've heard from, I've heard of from. Now, now what he heard I've seen was. It on was an Insta story. <laughs> 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 like, basically, he's talking about here gossip. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I don't know who this Saul is, but I know other people who say he's a terrible person. And I think. Maybe I'm off on a tangent here, but we have so much of the issue in church today where people hear stuff from other people. And uh, mm. as opposed to uh, God was like, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to go talk to this person. Go, you go talk to them yourself. And I'm telling you to go talk to them. He's like, oh, I don't know, Lord. I don't know, Lord, because I've heard this and I've heard that. I mean, it's easy to look at this text and think if God appeared right now and he was to say, go and do this, who am I to say no? But the reality is there's many things that God has told us to do. And we've been like, well, you've been arguing with it. Mm. Mm. Even though he hasn't appeared in the room, but you know that he's spoken to you and he said, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And you've been like, well, you know, I'm not sure if I'm feeling that. And I think that's probably a story of, that's, that's a true story. Mm -hmm. that's a true it's story. not uncommon with like the other, um, like, Bible pioneers you've got Moses he's like but God like you know speech isn't really my thing like mm. as humans like oftentimes we do just push back against God even when he turns up in like a burning bush mm. um that doesn't remove our doubts or fears mm. I mean sometimes it's like there's still a small voice isn't it like for example on this topic there are those moments where you've done something and you know it's wrong you realize it's wrong afterwards in the moment you didn't realize and then God is like you really should apologize to that person and then you try to justify why you don't have to apologize mm -hmm. in your own mind just to save yourself from that moment of having to humble yourself. It's the similar experience in a sense. You know God's speaking to you, but you just don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like what God says in verse 15. And this is an answer to Ananias. He was like, ah, he's this, that, the other. God says, go your way. And it's in the old King James. And it says, for he is, present tense, a chosen vessel to me. You don't hear God saying, oh, yeah, you know, well, I know he's been bad, but he's a work in process and there's a process going on and he's going to get there. He speaks in the present tense for this man who's only just had this, this experience on the road to Damascus. He says he is a chosen vessel for me and he's going to go to the Gentiles. Speaks like power into like Paul's existence, like he's mm -hmm. a chosen vessel to me. And I think this is a, a powerful aspect of forgiveness. Um, Paul has his road to Damascus experience and, and God says, yep, you're forgiven. That's what you are now. You're a chosen vessel. Um, mm. you know, oh, no doubt Paul may have struggled with stuff at, you know, after that experience, but God said, you are a chosen vessel. And I think that's something we struggle with. Like we've been forgiven by God, but, but, but then what, you know, is it like a, a one year process after that? Or is it a two year process after that? He's like, no, no, no. He's forgiven. He's a chosen vessel. That's a powerful mm. point because right. at this point he hasn't preached a sermon. He's still blind. He's still fasting, mm. but he's already a chosen vessel. And I think we were talking yesterday about how hard it is to forgive yourself when you can't make amends because he can't resurrect the people that he's already killed. But in that very moment, when he accepts the message, he's already a chosen vessel. And I think that's a very powerful point. Mm. 
I also mm-hmm. wondered, like, why, why had God decided to involve Ananias in the story? Like, he could have just done all of this on the Damascus Road, like, hi, Saul, you're a chosen vessel, and I want you to do this and to do that. But instead, like, he involves that human element, that, that community part in his conversion. Um, and Ananias takes, he copies and pastes the message that God gives him and takes it to Saul, like, he doesn't alter it. And he even, like, shows some forgiveness on his part when um, I think it's in verse maybe 15 no 14 when he's like the god of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and i think that's like there's a camaraderie there's a there's a us in that um and he's talking to someone who's been out here killing his people but now there's an us because god has said that there's an us i've chosen him and i've also chosen you obviously so there's now that community element and i think sometimes god does call us into ministry together um to do the work that he could do but he gives us the privilege of being co-partners with him mm. could i maybe like switch things a little bit we have mm-hmm. the online poll today so i just wanted to bring that up um we've missed it the last couple of nights actually or, or online question and it goes along with our subject tonight and the question that we asked online was um how do you support someone who says they have changed and wants to let go of a past um, way of life. So how do you support, it's similar to Paul, um, uh, where he's changed, but how do we today support someone? And these were the answers that we got online, just to kind of bring that up, maybe we can discuss this a little bit. One person said, embrace what's true and fair, change is part of life and keep, and keep developing. Um, another person said, build a genuine friendship with them where they can be open, love them, encourage them, and support them. Mm-hmm. Another person said, Don't, not, not to criticize or judge based on what you would do or your, sorry, not criticizing or judging based on what I would do or my own experiences. Mm. I think um, using your influence to try and bring them in to, uh, so say someone's just come from a certain lifestyle and they're, they're now in church, just using your influence, bring them into your circle. Um, you know, if you've got a platform for ministry, um, bring them in um, to help them um, get involved. I know oh, it's not just one and two people. There was, I mean, before, before we were all isolating, there was a time when Sabbath evening, right about now, sings, perlos, sabai sabai, places like those. And you just bring your friends in and um, it kind of helps bring people into a friendship group, helps to create a space. And then also, if you've got opportunities for ministry, what, what I love about this, what the question that you just asked is 26 and 27, mm. chapter nine. Mm. It mm. says, I went Saul was come to Jerusalem he said to join himself to, to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and mm. believed not that he was a disciple. Mm. But, then you got Barnabas but, comes in. But. but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto him how he had seen the Lord in the way and how he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas mm. used his influence mm. to bring Saul in. And some of us, some of us, we've got influence, and you can use that to try and help bring people in, um, you know, just and give them opportunities that they may not have been able to get without your influence. I think that's a really powerful point because a lot of the times we we talk a lot about Paul, but we don't really hear a lot about Barnabas. And Barnabas was actually a very very important part of shaping the life story of Paul. He's even the one who took him on what, like his first missionary journey when when. The Holy Spirit, I think it's in Acts chapter 13, calls Paul again. He puts Paul and Barnabas together because he sees that the need for somebody who can believe in Saul and forget, look beyond his past, you could say, um, and just encourage him in the ministry as well. See, I think that's a powerful, a powerful point. Definitely. But you know, um, one of the things that I always think about in terms of that point while we're on it, 
with Paul and Barnabas is the fact that Barnabas, Paul had made a mistake and everybody was afraid to give Paul a second chance, but Barnabas comes in and gives him that second chance. It's really interesting because when you go to Acts chapter 13, you have the same situation, but it's reversed with John Mark, mm -hmm. where they went to do some mission work. John Mark was like, this is too hard. He went back home. Then he wants to come back. Barnabas says yes, but Paul says no. Uh, it's really interesting how he couldn't return the favor to John Mark that Barnabas had given to him over something that was much, much worse than simply leaving the mission field because he was a little bit overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Ouch. That's it is an interesting uh, comparison in, in, in Paul's ministry experience. And, you know, I think the, the key thing is not every, not every decision Paul makes as a minister is maybe the, the correct one. And, and someone else stepped in and did, and did minister with John Mark and he was able to overcome where he may have had a weakness in, in life. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's so key. I mean, it was back at, you know, a, a few years ago. And, you know, we were, <laughs> I, have to, I have to be careful with these dates these days. And um, we had some people that we were trying to witness to. And as we're trying to witness to them, we realized that, you know, this person lives in a different area of the country. And then just linking them up with a friendship group or a, a church community just helped bring them in. And I feel like God does that back onto Melissa's initial question about why Ananias, when Jesus could have done it all himself. Um, I think Jesus has put the church on earth for a purpose. And part of that purpose is community. And, um, mm. you know, it's to be Jesus's body, it's to be his hands, it's to be his feet. Um, it's to go to the places where Jesus would go. And I feel like um, Jesus uses the church to reach people. And so he puts Paul in touch with Ananias. And I think that's what was going on there. Mm. Mm. I think also in the reverse, I was trying to think, what did Barnabas have to gain by advocating for Paul? And there was nothing really, like, I mean, there was nothing that like he was going to, no, no kudos, no um, status increase for advocating for this murderer, basically. Um, and the same for Ananias, him being obedient to God, I guess obedience is, of course, important. But I think there was a work that's actually done in us when we put ourselves out for others. Mm -hmm. um, in Barnabas advocating for Paul he was able to kind of show his fearlessness and trust in God in what God had said and the same for Ananias um, and I think also for us putting ourselves out there in Sam's case you know making those phone calls or connections oftentimes there's nothing that's going to be gained on our part but it does show that the fruit of the spirit is being born in us when we're able to do things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I had another question which is a practical one because sometimes people comment that Sometimes it's not quite as practical as I'd like it to be in the comments. We're going to try tonight for you guys. Um, what does it actually mean to be a new creature in Christ? What does it mean to be a new creature? Well, the text goes on and says, this is not necessarily answering the question directly, <laughs> but it says, all things are passed away. All things have become new. Mm -hmm. And so there's, a, there's an aspect that, you know, if, if you take apply that text to Saul's life, mm -hmm. um, old things are passed away. At least the way he thought had changed. How he viewed God, how he viewed the people of God had changed. And so those old things are passed away. He's got a new purpose. He's got a new identity. And he's, he's moving forward in, a, in, in Christ as opposed to being out of Christ. And, you know, and that's the greatest miracle, you know. Mm. When Jesus walked on water... When um, he spoke the world into existence, when he, he raised people from the dead, when he did those things, you know, when Jesus walked on water, the water doesn't have a will to say no. Right. Or when he speaks the world into existence and he says, let there be light, the light doesn't have a will to say no. But when mm. Jesus Christ transforms the heart and someone becomes a new creature, a person can resist that. But when it happens... Um, mm. just know that the greatest miracle ever has taken place mm. because I, despite the fact that someone's actively trying to resist somehow God's love got involved and mm. changed the person completely around just where you've got Saul his identity completely changes and he becomes poor mm. and like what pastor was saying now he's got he's on new things he's got new mm. motives he's got he's got new ways of thinking he's got new patterns of behavior um, he's just got 
a new way of living life. But how do we know that it wasn't just willpower? Like, how do you know that he just wasn't, like, just committed? Like, you know what, that was, those things were bad, you know, killing people and stuff and, you know, tearing families apart. Not so great. I'm just going to try and just be a better person. How does a new creature ha- have a supernatural element attached? Yeah, because, I mean, Paul in Romans chapter 8, he says that the carnal or the natural man you know, it, it's enmity against God because it cannot, it is not subject to the law of God and it cannot be. Mm-hmm. So in the Bible, we're told that it is not possible, like what some was saying, in and of ourselves through just natural means to actually just wake up one day and say, you know what, I want to study the Bible or I want to be loving today without the Holy mm-hmm. Spirit pushing some kind of button. So even before he was converted, like what some was saying before, the Holy Spirit was pushing, but he was resisting. And the new creature no longer resists, but now wants to do what God says, even if it's not easy and it's not natural, Mm -hmm. but we now listen where before we were not willing to listen. Mm -hmm. We didn't care what God wanted, whereas now we do. Hmm. Any thoughts? Do we sometimes try and walk in willpower as new creatures? Like after baptism, I can definitely remember like believing that the Holy Spirit would come and do something in me, but also definitely switching up that aspect of myself off and just really trying hard and failing often, falling often, because I was trying to do it in my own strength. Can anyone else relate? Mm. Mm. And I, I think it also doesn't help that we live in a generation where there's so much self-help stuff. <laughs> like True. there's loads of self-help. You can pick up a book, you can read a blog, and it can give you like five steps to being more truthful or five steps to letting things go that has no involvement of the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. at all and I think we can become really self-reliant on ourselves but also on other people so whether that's a good friend who gives good advice which I'm not saying is a bad thing because it's not Um, but I think ultimately our dependence needs to be on God and on the Holy Spirit and all those other additives they can be great but knowing that is coming from God. Hmm. that's true that's true and so where journey oh good no no and, and, and i think and i think that journey of being a new creature so you become a new creature but i think you're also becoming a new creature mm. go on so so um so the old man has you've got to die daily mm. um and i think we were talking about this I can't remember when we, were, when we were talking about this last, but it's not something, you know, you, you, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. But then as the closer you come to Christ, the more you realize there's more of my mind that needs to be renewed. Um, because you're seeing more and more things that's like, hold on, I didn't realize. And then you got to. So I think um, the process of becoming a new creature isn't, it's something that happens when someone decides to follow Jesus Christ, that's one side of things, mm. but it's something that continues. So that, yeah, that's what, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. It's something that continues. Mm. Lisa, I'll cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, it was just going to change angles, but that's okay. Mm. And I think when we look at the, the different characters we looked at throughout this week and you see what their life was like after forgiveness, mm. um, you see them moving on. Um, mm. I mean, we've looked at um, Mary, this week after forgiveness there's a you know there's, there's a key change we've looked at peter after he was forgiven and restored by jesus at the at the lake of uh, galilee he he goes on and you know you know powerful disciple baptizes thousands in the book of acts and and uh looked at this week they, they they had an encounter with christ they were forgiven and their life after is evidence that you know, there's been a change, there's been a transformation, not something that willpower can do, not something that, you know, like as Nisa said, five steps to this can do. It's got to be something that's, it's something that, that indicates a, a supernatural encounter with the Holy Spirit that, that changes and transforms and, and changes their desires and, and, and they move on. So making this practical, I guess, that kind of new life aspect, um, when we think of the people in society that oftentimes are the types that maybe wouldn't 
evangelize to so in my mind sometimes I think of like my um my family members who perhaps are from another Christian denomination who for some might consider that's like a you know a conversion within Christianity into Adventism um but then there's those in society that perhaps you might consider harder to evangelize or to reach to. Perhaps if they're struggling with a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction or are living a lifestyle that's very different to that of Christ. How do we kind of talk about new life in a way that can connect with people in those kind of circumstances? Mm. Mm. That's really interesting. Can I just kind of ask another question? Mm -hmm. But I think it still ties in with yours. So as Pastor Adam was making his point, I was thinking about how um, when, when we do have a new life, so someone has had a conversion experience and they're now having a new life, but the things that they did in their, in their previous life, their previous way of living can still have an impact, like they can still be echoes. So for example, you might have been an alcoholic and as a result of that, you might have lost your family, might have impacted your, I don't know, your, your brain, your ability to think and stuff like that. So although your, your life is new, could there still be, I don't wanna say consequences, but things that still have an impact as a result of how you lived before, mm. even though your life is new. So you're no longer actively participating in, in that badness, mm. but the badness has had an effect. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense. I think so. I think, yeah, go on. No, go on, Sam. I think so. Um, so there might be some things that, boom, you know, at baptism, I've stopped doing this. And there are some other things that you've got to wrestle with God through in prayer. Mm -hmm. um, Nathan just gave the example. Barnabas, you, you, see, you see what Paul's, Paul's, um, Paul's temperament is like. He's a go-getter. He's, go he's a go-doer. Um, you know, mm -hmm. he, he's done uni straight away he's gonna got his phd he's part of the sanhedrin mm. he, he's, he's that type of guy and so whatever he's on he's on so now he's on the mm. jesus christ wing. he's doing missionary work he's out and about and so barnabas extended to him some grace when it was time for for paul to extend to john mark some grace haven't got the time because i'm on things mm. and that's something that um people have to wrestle with and Paul even says it you know not that I've already apprehended yeah mm. um but, you know forgetting those things which are behind I press towards the mark mm -hmm. so Paul even recognizing in his own life um that I'm not I'm not where I want to be but I'm still pressing towards the mark mm. um yeah and I think that's um, a key that's a, that's a key point to remember as part of a new birth and a new life experience after you know, a major conversion experience. Someone brought it up in the comments yesterday when we were talking. Um, I, I noticed that they're talking about sanctification, uh, a big word for, you know, the, the daily Christian life that we live in and that daily change that we go through with Christ. And it's not an instantaneous thing. It's something that happens day by day, week by week, year by year. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the illustration Sam brought up is, is you know, a proof in, 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 in Paul's life that there was this, there was this process that God was working with him, even though he's already, um, you know, he's already experienced that conversion. There's still this refining process going on throughout. And I think sometimes new Christians struggle with that. Well, if I, I've, I've, I've given my life to Christ, I've been converted, I got baptized, I've, you know, I've been forgiven by the Lord then, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then now there's these other things they start to see or these struggles they start to have. And, you know, where did that all come from? Well, it's part of the process of, of Christ refining us and, 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 you know, pointing things out in time. I mean, another one, Peter. Um, do you remember when, so Peter's converted now. He's been through his reconciliation. Um, he's preached on the day of Pentecost. He's done his thing. But then Paul has to go and rebuke him because you, do, you, you hang around with the Gentiles, but when the Jews come, you don't, want to show, you don't want to show your face with them. So here you see even Peter, this is a person that um, was a martyr for, mm -hmm. for Jesus had his own struggles that Jesus was still working with him on. Mm. So, yeah. I've had a question, um, I guess, relating to the one that I asked originally from someone asking, how do you actually follow Jesus? So in the, the case of Saul to Paul, he suddenly like realizes that Jesus is real and um, 
his first steps obviously he knows much about the bible and maybe some of the prophecies and things but now he has to become a follower of christ and um, we had a question from someone who's not adventist in the in the comments he's asking how do i follow jesus so how would I we respond guys one of the things, um, one of the things that came to my mind when I saw that comment was I was thinking back to Paul's initial response because he wasn't a Christian, and so he might have been asking, "How do I follow Jesus?" As well, in that moment, I think the, the 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 most basic and the most fundamental thing is when Paul sees the vision and he realizes that he's Jesus was speaking to him. His first response was, "Lord, what do you want me to do?" Mm. it's very hard to follow Jesus if you've already set preconditions on what you are willing to do and what you're not willing to do mm. and I think sometimes we want to do what's right or we tell God how we want him to lead us then it's very difficult for us to follow Jesus because often the way that Jesus wants us to operate is very different to how we might be inclined to operating I think the, the most practical thing fundamentally is I guess you call it surrender after his conversion, every single one of his letters, Paul always introduces himself as a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He has no rights. He has no will of his own. He just wants to do what God wants him to do. He's willing to go wherever God asks him to go. And I think it's very difficult for us to follow Jesus unless we're willing to do the small steps. Uh, because sometimes it's like a step-by-step -step thing, like what Adam was saying. And it's like one step leads to the next step, to the next step. And the more we're willing to take that step, he will show us more and more light and then we keep on growing in a natural mm. way. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Just, to, just to further, further add on to, so if you look at this, this so, so, so in this text, Paul wasn't following Jesus and you see in this story how Paul begins to follow Jesus. Mm. So um, one of the things he does, in, you see that in, in verse nine is, is um, He's, he's not eating or drinking. That means he's, he's fasting. He's praying. He's praying. Um, one of the things that you do when you begin to follow Jesus is um, you begin to pray. I don't know if you've ever prayed. I don't know who asked the question, but I don't know if you've ever prayed before. Um, but, but basically, prayer is like talking to God as a friend. Mm. And you can simply ask him that question. Mm. Jesus, I want to follow you. Show me how. So then, then also, you see something here. Um, there's this guy called Ananias, who, who asked the question. He's part of a church. So now Paul links himself up um, with, with this guy called Ananias, who's part of a church, he's representative of a church. And Ananias brings him into this church setting. Um, so he's, 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 he's praying. He's, he's involved in church. Um, He's to, when, he, when he's in, in following Jesus, one of the things that he does is he speaks back to Jesus and he's listening to what Jesus does. And one of the ways we speak and, and we listen to what Jesus does is through what Jesus has written to us. And that's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So prayer um, is us speaking to God. Reading the Bible is, is God speaking to us. Linking up with the church community um, is one of the ways in which we place ourselves in an environment which makes it conducive to following Jesus and um, getting involved with somebody locally who can help you with that. I don't know if anybody else had any thoughts. That was nice and mm -hmm. succinct. And of mm -hmm. course, like in terms of community, though we're not actually meeting in person, like should you want to have Bible studies or chat to anyone, um, I'm sure we can get in touch and see if we can support you further after this. Mm -hmm. Um, today, I know we wanted to spend a bit more time in prayer as it's our last evening in our youth week of prayer. So just while we're kind of wrapping up this discussion, if you want to add comments um, on Facebook for prayer requests, then we can mention them um, when we come to praying in a little while. But as we kind of close, guys, from the week, what are our lessons? Are there any things that we're going to take away to do, to act on? Have you been, have you been pricked? Um, as Sam <laughs> talked about at the beginning. <laughs> Any of the stories that really resonated with us? What's next? Mm. Silence. <laughs> so, 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 come again, come again, Melissa. Thank you. I mean, per asking. personally, the story that resonated with me, the, uh, which I liked, I don't know if it resonates with me the most, but I really appreciated when we went through it this week was the story of Joseph. He's one of my favorite characters. And not just Joseph, but his brothers and how all those dynamics, that family drama of how he forgave them, 
and then you, you you see that process where they you know they still live with um guilt or fear of their brother even after their father dies and they have to come to the point where they they lay things down as well to me that that mm -hmm. that whole life that they they lived and then even after he forgave them they still that's that's something that i really um appreciated when we went through that and resonated and uh in yeah mm -hmm. I think a takeaway for me was like our first lesson um, as ambassadors of reconciliation. I never really thought of myself as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, kind of having that as a bit of a subtitle um, from 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And the idea that I'm a representative of God, he's already extended his arm to kind of bridge the gap and to reconcile him reconcile us to him and my role having found and been part of that reconciliation process is now to kind of extend that arm to others and help them to reach and to kind of to see that God's hands outstretched to them so evangelism or reaching other people is now just about me kind of being a bit of a mediator between them and God and helping them to find that hand to be joined to him as well mm. I think one uh, that really... go on Lisa go on Thank you. Um, I think mine is Mary. When we talked about Mary, there's a couple of things. So Mary and her, her worship to Christ, just knowing how much she had been forgiven and not being shy about that and not being so concerned about what other people might think about her past and where she is now, but having that personal relationship with Christ. Mm. Um, and another thing that really um, struck me was the apology languages and I think what was great about that is being able to recognize that people apologize in different ways so I think I need to wise up to that a bit because I have been ignorant to other people's apologies so sorry to everybody who's ever apologized to me and I just kind of bypassed that because I didn't understand it I wasn't speaking the same language as you but just that awareness has been great for me and one more thing I've got a habit of ad-libbing, ad ad-libbing when someone's trying to apologize and I'll add bits like, yeah, and then, and then, and then you did this. And <laughs> not doing that is not helpful. So yeah, those things for me. Mm. I think maybe one of the things as well that in addition was the story of Peter and just that moment where, you know, after he, after the cock crows, Jesus looks at him, he looks at Jesus and the dynamics that happen, there are no words being spoken. But just realizing that God is not out to get us. He's on our side and he's always wanting to reconcile us to himself and that we can always go back. Um, and the, the prodigal son as well, just the fact that we need to be willing to extend the same forgiveness to other people um, as we would want to also receive if we're in their situation. Mm. One of Something. the comments... Oh, just to add one, one of the comments has come in, um, talks about the takeaways, relationship building, meeting a need from a genuine place, letting the Holy Spirit do the conversion with you supporting and taking the lead from the Holy Spirit. Mm. Sorry, Pastor, you can say something. Oh, Sam. No. Um, so probably a takeaway for me will be the whole aspect of, and we've, we've seen it in different stories. We've seen it in David. We've seen it in, in, in Peter, we've seen it in Paul. Um, this is my life up until this point. And though I may have been doing things actively working against the plan of God for my life up until this point, it may not be in all areas, but in some areas, that even though that's what's going on up until right now, I can choose by the grace of God to move forward in a new direction. Mm. And that um, I can forget the things which are behind and press towards the mark mm. and that even though I've got all this history and I might have to experience some of the consequences of that God will be with me in the process and um, I think that's something I'm going to take away that from this week of prayer that there's I may have been doing x y and z up until now but um, moving forward from this week of prayer I know there's certain things that God would have me to do and I can move forward with them in full confidence a bit like what Paul was doing and just move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my takeaway. Awesome. Well, um, if can anyone see the comments on Facebook if there are any prayer requests? There's one that came in for the youth of Liverpool North um, to to grow together in Christ connected. 
and to be a group ready to fulfill their mission there up there in Liverpool. And that was one that I saw. I'm not sure if there's mm. been any others. Mm. Okay. Well, that's our last night. Maybe we can say a short prayer each. Sure. There's been a few, there's a few other people that would remain um, anonymous, but that have requested prayer for um, sickness or things like that, that are go, that's going around at this time. So there are a number of our members who are sick and relatives of members who are sick at this time. And people aren't sure if it's, you know, mm. COVID or not, but there's, you know, that's a fear that a lot of people have. And so let's keep uh, those individuals and, and, and people in prayer. Hi guys, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we pause and thank you for the privilege we have to bow our heads before you this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the time we've been able to spend together as an online community scattered around different homes in this country or even maybe further afield. And we thank you that we've been able to meet on this forum and discuss the topic of forgiveness this week. I pray, Lord, that it's not just something we discuss or listen to or ponder on, but it's something that we practically um, do it's something we practically seek from you and it's something we practically offer to other people as well lord impress upon our minds those that we need to forgive impress upon our mind those that we need to ask forgiveness from and lord impress upon us where we need to ask forgiveness from you with repentance and confession lord we pray that you would truly transform and change our lives i pray especially for the request that's come in that was mentioned there youth of the Liverpool North SDA Church, that you would bless them, be with the leaders of the church, be with the youth leaders, be with each of the young people who are there, that they would be committed to you and may be able to be a light for you in the city of Liverpool. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, this evening, just want to thank you for the opportunity to share, to be able to minister in different ways. Um, and, you know, for making sure that there's technology for such a time as this. In times when um, we've been secluded in our homes, want to pray for anybody who's feeling lonely. Please may they feel your closeness to them. I'm praying, dear Lord, for the COVID-19 situation. Many of our members um, are sick. Many family members of members are sick. I know Wolverhampton and around, around the country, dear Lord, um, there's been some deaths. And we're just asking, Heavenly Father, that you will bring comfort to the bereaved. That you'll help us to stand strong in this time. Um, be with those who are in hospital and those who are working and those who are being treated. And um, give us your strength to be able to carry on and to have your joy in our hearts despite the circumstances. And give us the peace which passes all understanding. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Father in heaven, I come to you this evening, God. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity throughout this whole week to meet online and to discuss, to think, and to even pray about forgiveness. Lord, I pray that this would just be the beginning. And I ask that as the Holy Spirit impresses different things on our hearts as the days unfold, that we would respond in obedience to you and that we would know that it isn't in our own strength, God, that any of this can be accomplished, but it's only through you. I also ask, God, that we would be reminded of the, the forgiveness that you have extended to us and that you continue to extend to us all the time and that we can pass this on to other people. God, I'd also like to specifically pray for families that are isolating together. And I pray that there would be love at home and that there would be peace and harmony, Lord. And um, I pray that you would inspire parents who might be um, finding this a little bit tricky with creative ideas of how to keep the kids engaged and I pray that all the glory may be given to you in Jesus name I pray amen amen Heavenly Father I want to thank you for this um, time that we've been able to spend this week learning more about this important topic of forgiveness um, how we can be able to mend the relationships that are broken in our own families our friendship circles our churches but also to focus on our relationship with you I thank you for the examples that we find in the Bible, which are so relevant to our own personal lives and the situation that we encounter. And I just pray that you may be with us. Um, you've told us in 2 Corinthians 5 that you have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that we can be ministers of um, to other people to draw them closer to each other and closer to you help us Lord, to be peacemakers in our churches in our families so we can be part of the process of bringing people together um, help us lord to have the strength to forgive others for the wrongs that they do to us but help us lord, to also be able to look beyond our own sins and our own faults and see um, the cross and the forgiveness and the grace that you're willing to give up to us as well lord so that we can be transformed and we can be able to have a closer walk with you um, we pray for all of the different youth across the conference and across the world and the church members as well especially at this time when the churches are closed help us lord to stay connected to each other and to you as well lord so that um, none, none may be lost um, or none may drift away from you through these weeks of isolation and lockdown but help us to keep on um, finding innovative ways to use the technology to connect with one another and i just pray lord for the families who've been affected by um, this virus situation the ones who are not feeling well who have the symptoms um, the ones who have passed away lord i pray that you may be with their families um, i pray that you may be with those who are working on the front line for this virus as well lord give wisdom give strength to those who are making the strategies so that um, no unnecessary loss uh, may be sustained through this whole um, process mm -hmm. we pray for all these things in Jesus' name amen amen Amen. 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 Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege of Sabbath. Thank you for the rest that you've given to us. And now that it's drawn to a close, God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would persist with us throughout this week, Father, that we would be hungry for your word. And as we heard this morning in um, the sermon that Pastor Ramden preached, Lord, that we would make great use of this time of isolation and um, to spend more time getting to know you, Lord, so we can hear your voice, to spend time in your words, so we can hear from you, Lord. I pray, God, for um, those that are working on the front lines, Lord, I pray for your hedge of protection to be about them, our nurses and doctors and pharmacists. God, I just pray, Lord, that you'll protect them and keep them as they do a great work um, to keep our nation safe and put themselves at risk. God, I just pray um, for the families um, that are around them and supporting. Lord, I pray that you'll be with them also. And just go with us this week, Heavenly Father, and continue to give us a hunger for your word. The things we pray and thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys. Hey, I'm going to miss you guys. I'm going to call you. I'm just going to call you guys <laughs> every night at 7 15. Yeah. Just go back to day number one. Not again. Right. Just keep watching day it. <laughs> Pastor, what's what, we... what next? What, what next? Um, to those who are still listening, there is a next. But we don't know what the next is yet. Okay. <laughs> but we can assure you that we're not going to be uh, leaving no communication online from now until next sabbath we're definitely gonna we'll have a service next sabbath but there's going to be other stuff happening in the week we'll announce it probably tomorrow or monday so keep an eye on our facebook page keep an eye on our instagram gram page and send us messages if you got any ideas of things you'd like to see done interactively online we're open to all the creative ideas that you may have please send them into us and we'll try and facilitate and and make as much online community support and, and spiritual growth happen as we can. Mm. Oh, and the counseling stuff, we're going to share that with you guys too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Awesome. Oh, I'm mad. Oh. Right, guys. Look to you. Say bye, everyone. I'm going to cut the live stream. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> See you guys. Have a good week. Cut it. <laughs> <laughs> bye. bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs>